Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture comes from the book of Luke, chapter 3. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Inspired by the spirit, let this be our call extending Christ's love and acceptance to all. As far as I know, he may be the most locally famous member of our church, though I still hold out hopes for some of you. And though famous, you may not know him. Every Sunday, despite wind or weather, Joe Nichols and his wife, Mary Lou, come in through our atrium doors always. He wearing his customary sweaters and she clad in a stylish hat. Quietly they come in. Quietly they sit in the exact same pew, piano side, almost to the very front. And quietly they depart. Do you know, Joe, chances are you've seen his name, maybe even hundreds of times. If you ever drive east on Highway 364 as it crosses the River Road, you've passed under the Joe R. Nichols Bridge. It was so named by the St. Charles County Highway Department, where Joe worked for 21 years as the county's chief engineer the person responsible for all of the highways, roads, bridges, water, planning, and zoning work during the period of the county's greatest growth. More than anyone, Joe's responsible for getting us to where we need to go. Cheers to Joe. Cheers to all those civil engineers who, behind the scenes, work tirelessly to get us safely where we need to be. Among its many accomplishments, none may have been more important to the Roman Empire than its achievements in civil engineering. The 264-mile-long aqueduct of Valens supplying Constantinople was its longest. The Aqua Virgo in Rome to this day still supplies water to the Trevi Fountain. And the roads, securing commerce for the ever-expanding empire, may have been the real secret weapon of the army, ensuring that troops got quickly from one place to the next. Many Roman roads are still in use. You reckon that 2,000 years from now, people will still pass underneath the Joe R. Nichols Bridge? I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but as much as I think of Joe, I think probably not. It's the work of the civil engineer to which we're all called. Our text today, parts of which appear in all four Gospels, speak of the work of John the Baptist, who calls us using the imagery of the prophet Isaiah to make the paths of the Lord straight, every valley filled, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked made straight, and the rough places smooth. No potholes to report, just an easy journey. We're to do this for others. Are you with me? Admittedly, we in the church have too often made it a hard road with confusing communications, countless hypocrisies, and legalisms that emphasize law more than grace. Jesus said, Come to Me, 
all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We've done just the opposite, making it hard for people to be in a relationship with Jesus. Do you know anyone who's been turned off by the church and consequently turned away from Jesus. Ours has too often felt more like bad news than good. Speaking a hard truth, Matthew Corpman says, if your view of God can't recognize when God begins to look more like the devil than Jesus, it means your view of Jesus isn't that far from the devil. And I know that I've shared with you before the observation that you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. Our job is to lead people to Jesus, not away from Him, to Him, not to us, not to our ways of seeing the world, but to him and his way of being in the world let me help you with this we don't get them there by being jerks it's our job to prepare the way it's a way for others not ourselves it's work for a future we may never see in fact it's for people we may never know Perhaps it's partly the wisdom that comes as we get older and need less for ourselves, but as we age, more and more of what we can do will be for generations that follow, a way for others to go, even if we can't go with them. And it's our job to help get others to a place where they never dream to go. This is civil engineering of the spiritual sort. We're in the business of getting people to a place they never dreamed they could go. An old tried and true word for it is repentance. This is what repentance does. It's about getting people to a new place. I have a friend who for years was in a very bad place and headed nowhere with her life. At least, nowhere good. With the help of friends, she got out of an abusive relationship. With the help of scholarship, she went back to school and got an education. With the help of some mentors, she got a job. Slowly but surely, she got to a new place in her life. It all came with the help of others. They were helping her get to a new place. They may not have used this language, but it's the work of repentance. It's the civil engineering of the spiritual sort. It's the work of helping others get to a place they could not otherwise go. And in this sense, maybe we're also all called to be Baptist in the sense of the one called John. You didn't think by any chance I was encouraging you to be any other kind of Baptist. Like John, we're to be a voice, to have the mission of our life as a voice. You and I are here to lift our lives like a kind of music. God wants us to sing like a song, to speak us into the world like a true and beautiful word. Of course, we are inadequate. A friend of mine tells about the most unforgettable performance of the Messiah that he ever attended. As it turned out, it occurred in the same church that Pastor Kate 
many decades later, was raised. My friend was a teenager at the time of the performance. Two of the soloists for that evening, he said, were imported professionals. The other two, including the tenor, were talented but non-professional musicians and members of our church. What made the hour so memorable was the illness of the tenor. We all knew he'd been sick and had a bad throat. We wondered if he'd be able to sing, but he was there in his place. When the overture ended, he stood and opened his mouth to sing comfort. And what came out was not comfort at all. The voice was cracked, raspy, excruciating. We wondered if he'd stop and sit down. The conductor looked at him with eyebrows raised, full of permission to quit. But he kept singing, cracking, breaking the notes like vases. We all developed a sudden interest in our shoes. Everyone blushed and squirmed as he kept on missing those impossible notes. On and on he went for six tortuous minutes. He sang about valleys coming up, but they stayed low. And the mountains wouldn't budge for him. And by the end, to our assaulted ears, all the crooked and rough places seemed more crooked and rough than ever before. He was a good man. In his right voice, he could sing the piece beautifully. But on this night, before all those expectant faces, he wasn't up to it. And he kept singing. I'm glad now, my friend says, that he did. His public agony with these words could be said to be a sign to you and me. To be a person of faith is not only to believe some things about the universe and about God, but it's also to believe some things about yourself. A belief, for example, that your life has a purpose. People of faith accept the dare that our existence is not meaningless, but that we exist for a reason, that we live and move beneath a kind of calling. That's quite a claim for us to make, for faith to make. But many of us make it. Under God, we are purposefully here in order to be something. The question is, what? We could give many names to our essential calling, but I'd like to try one of them on for size. A voice crying in the wilderness. Our ignorance may be monumental. We're often wrong-headed and wrong-hearted. We can be more than a little bit foolish. So, of course, our lives aren't worthy of the music that we're asked to carry. But here's the thing to remember. Whose music, after all, is it? Whose word are we expected to carry? And if the music's maker and source bids us to be instruments of it, how could our inadequacy possibly matter? We're not the point. God's Word, God's music is the point. Our only part is to open our mouths, our hearts, our arms, our lives, and let the Word and music pass through us like breath through the pipes and chords of an instrument. Ready or not, you just give yourself to it, and your life is a good enough voice. The world isn't waiting 
for eloquence. The world isn't waiting for someone more perfect or with all the answers. The world is waiting for ordinary voices, faltering as they are, to say the true word they have. From there, the word will do its work. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Above all, do not be afraid of your weakness, your guilt, your grief. Do not run from these into a life that is too silent. Bring them to the one who knows what to do with all that is crooked, including and especially the voices our lives make. If only we'll offer them, crooked and rough as they are, the power of God will lift them and use them and make them more than straight enough to serve. The wilderness awaits.